Thank you very much and greetings from Bohemia and from Bohemia Interactive. Uh, Joanna, thank you for a uh, great introduction. Uh, thank you for this opportunity and uh, without further ado, let's delve into the video game vegetation 101. Uh, well, uh, I've been working on uh, uh, video game environments for some time. Uh, since 2006, uh, I've been working in, at Bohemia Interactive as uh, environment designer, uh, lead designer, and creative director. Uh, I uh, have a master's degree in environmental sciences. I took part uh, in some forestry research as a PhD student, uh, uh, which uh, turned me into a passionate hiker uh, with the uh, archive of uh, more than 200 gigabytes of landscape photos. So uh, this uh, talk will be really something. Uh, I don't want to talk about the technicalities, about the uh, video game art, uh, about uh, really, uh, if you wouldn't understand something, you can research it some more. I may not be entirely precise in talking about all the mm, scientific details. Let's just not worry about it. I'm trying to uh, highlight the most important things. Uh, so, uh, green plants. Uh, uh, as some of you may know, they are capable of photosynthesis, which makes them a really important part of biosphere. Uh, it's because thanks to light and the green uh, compound called chlorophyll, they are able to turn carbon dioxide, uh, which is product of breathing, uh, and water into carbohydrates and oxygen. Uh, you know, they can be really big, they can be really small, but uh, the green color on this world map shows uh, how big portion of our planet they inhabit and how important they are as part of our environment. Of course, we are game developers, so uh, we are not interested in planetary ecology. We uh, are interested in how to make them look good, how to make them look authentic, perhaps, or how to stylize them. And uh, uh, when you start uh, researching how do plants look like, uh, please pay attention to their habit. Uh, neither good nor bad habit, simply habit in Latin habitus. It's uh, characteristic of their typical appearance or of the forms in which they exist. There's some ambiguity to the term, but uh, don't worry, you will get a hand of it. Uh, in fact, it's a result of plant traits. Uh, so, for example, this uh, uh, this rowan um, uh, in in the picture, it's uh, uh, it has quite typical branching leaves uh, or fruits uh, in this case, and of course, it was influenced by the local condition, resulting in this like a fairly damaged and uh, thinned habitus. Uh, let's take a look at another example: uh, Pinus silvestris, aka. Uh, aka European forest pine. Uh, it's uh, one of the most ubiquitous uh, uh, European conifers. And uh, uh, if you look at those pictures just based on age or uh, uh, conditions in which uh, particle um, uh, tree grows, it looks very different. So again, we can talk about the various habits. Uh, so uh, if you pay, pay attention to habits of your plants, you make sure to depict your plants accurately. But if you want to describe or systematize them properly, you look into the plant morphology. Uh, uh, plants have vegetative parts, roots, stem leaves, and they have generative parts, flowers or inflorescences, groups of flowers, and fruits, which contain seeds. Vegetative parts um, are maintaining the basic functions, uh, the metabolism growing, while the generative parts serve for reproduction. Uh, if you would be into systematic botany, uh, knowing intimately uh, various details about the varieties of flowers and, uh, and other hereditary traits, uh, 
uh, would allow you to systematize uh, the plants. But you don't really need to worry about it. But you know, once you uh, figure out you want to make certain plant, it's just good for inspiration. And even if you are making something completely fictional, looking into the earthly plant morphology may yield some very interesting and very surprising things. Of course, uh, an individual plant uh, may flourish or grow very differently based on some long-term factors which are related to location. Uh, it results in the whole system of biogeography, but uh, to sum it up, uh, water, irrigation, sunlight, temperature, and, and nutrition together uh, uh, define efficiency of photosynthesis. On the other hand, there are some long-term stressing factors, pollution, pests. Uh, it can be just uh, adversity of some of the, uh, or scarcity of some of the uh, things the plants need. Uh, so uh, you can have something which is utterly stressed, uh, growing on some rocky place. Uh, let's remember the pine, or uh, you can have a nice tall forest tree. And of course, even, even those two habitual forms may look differently based on the circadian rhythm. Well, some plants do that, like opening their flowers in the morning uh, to be poll uh, pollinated by certain species of insects. But uh, what's really interesting is the seasonal appearance changes. Uh, in the picture in the background, you can see that we are in the late autumn, uh, with uh, some trees being completely devoid of leaves, defoliated, some are still sporting some uh, nice yellow canopies. Uh, uh, if you want to delve more into the variation uh, of uh, plants through the seasons, uh, try to look at the phenology, uh, which is a sci uh, scientific discipline on the boundary of meteorology and botany. So long story short, individual plants may look very differently, uh, not just based on location, but also based on time. Uh, let's look more into the plant ecology. Uh, you know, we are constantly circling around it. Uh, all, all the plants, as all living beings, have two major goals to reproduce and spread to uh, facilitate their survival. And uh, due to this, they fight for resources. And as various uh, plants developed uh, to have various traits, various abilities, resistances, or preferences, they inhabit particular ecological niche. The niches should not be understood just as places, but um, uh, they also contain uh, interactions or or conditions which are not directly related to location, like uh, you know humidity or relationship with uh, some other living organism. Uh, there are some strategies uh, plants adopt to compete. Uh, some just use the conditions as best as possible and they are competitors. So for example, your common tree growing in the woods, they are trying to follow the light and outgrow the surroundings. Uh, there may be some plants resistant to stress uh, inhabiting places and ecological niches uh, in the mountains. And uh, there, there are plants which strategy is to uh, inhabit places uh, uh, with the ongoing disturbances where neither competitors nor uh, simple stress resistant plants can flourish so uh, uh, like uh, some of the endemic plants uh, living in the Czech military training areas and uh, 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 on the artillery practicing grounds like you see in the image and if you want to keep it really simple, uh, uh, just follow water. Wherever there is water, you can uh, you can let your plants be and flourish. And uh, of course, uh, this can be also used for uh, uh, formulating some basic procedural uh, population algorithms. But in a sense, if you look into plant ecology, it makes you understand where to use the plants you've made. Uh, obviously, plants don't exist by themselves, they usually form communities. Uh, they are also called phyto phytosynosis, uh, and uh, they can be defined as uh, groups of species living in a particular place. Those places with a specific condition are often called biotopes. Uh, and uh, you can have uh, temperate forest biotope, you can have 
pond bank biotope, you can have a uh, mountain stream biotope, you can have swamp biotope, uh, and uh, uh, they obviously differ a lot. You know, um, some are really wet, some are stressed, some are wind swept, some are calm. Uh, some, uh, like uh, most of Iceland uh, on the very right, uh, is so inhospitable that you can hardly find anything there. But uh, based on different conditions, uh, uh, completely different communities of plants can develop there. It also happens in a, a planetary scale. Uh, so if you want to simulate the planet, or if you want to uh, get some basic direction of what plant, plants you want to use, uh, definitely take a look at the biomes, uh, which are the distinct biological communities with uh, plants and animals alike, uh, which are formed in response to climate, which is obviously influenced by many other things like uh, hydrology, uh, geology. Uh, and of course, uh, as part of it, uh, you may also be interested in uh, extent of species occurrence on Earth uh, or plant aerials. On the map, uh, you can see the extent of uh, or aerial of uh, Fagus sylvatica linus or beach. Uh, if we would be in the North America, there would be probably a similar plant inhabiting the temperate forest biome with uh, just very similar ecological traits and preferences inhabiting similar niche. Uh, it would be just different. So if you look at the planet as a wall, uh, its uh, biomes are not always the same. There's also these biogeographic region, regions as some sort of subunits. Uh, and my favorite, uh, altitude on the nation, which is great if you have fairly small uh, game world and uh, you seek for opportunity to adding very distinct aerials on a much smaller scale. Uh, interesting uh, thing is that uh, it uh, does not work with just the elevation, but also insulation. Uh, so shady and sunny side of a mountain can have very different uh, characteristics. Like uh, as you can see on the scheme, uh, on the sunny side, uh, tree line is much higher because it's simply slightly more hospitable and warmer. On the other hand, in the steppes of uh, far Asia in Siberia, uh, uh, sunny side uh, uh, may be so much insulated that uh, evaporation practically prevents trees from development. And this is a picture from uh, my visit to Slovakia, uh, Malá Fatra, which I really recommend to visit, uh, where uh, when you start climbing this mountain, uh, you first start in the beech woods, then you climb up to the spruce forests, uh, then you start meeting the dwarf pine, Pinus mugo, only to arrive to the rocky tops with alpine meadows. And now, my favorite. Uh, uh, of course, if it wouldn't be us, uh, biosphere would be just uh, growing and developing uh, into its normal forms. Alas, we are here influencing uh, uh, it on a daily basis. We even introduce species. We uh, make some species extinct. Uh, we definitely change the dynamics and we change how the landscape looks like. So it can be agriculture or forestry, which is just the agriculture with big trees. Uh, uh, it can be grazing with, you know, in Czech Republic, I suppose also in Austria, there are pl uh, places in the mountains which started to be grazed in uh, Bronze Age. Uh, and they were not forested ever since. Transportation causes migration of species, which may invade uh, local ecosystems. There are also natural protected areas with their own management. You can either uh, you know, uh, shell some uh, precious uh, military training ground to make sure that endemic little plant is still living in the craters, or you can protect uh, these beautiful things like the sandstone uh, rock cities with their very specific ecosystems. Uh, landscaping, uh, where uh, uh, men uh, are completely changing landscape, for example, after coal mining, which is the case of this lake in North Bohemia. Uh, in industry. Uh, uh, with uh, emitting energy 
or pollution with its infrastructure creating a very different kind of uh, uh, of biotopes uh, it can be gardening you know uh, you're introducing something pretty and something very artificial to the landscape and of course uh, similar to uh, invasion species uh, uh, genetically modified organisms these plants uh, pose the danger of uh, 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 basically outgrowing the ecosystem because for example they may not have any any local enemies and they would disbalance so uh, What's important for us as game developers is that the vegetation may reflect the game world's history or current situation or uh, you know the local uh, human activities, and uh, you can tell a lot using uh, uh, this man-made landscape. Well, uh, if you start uh, populating your asset lists uh, with the idea of making some nice game world. Uh, you should first define your needs to see in which world uh, your game takes place. So where is the game set? When is it set? Because it may be just some season. Uh, and then what you expect from your vegetation? Is it just the aesthetics? Is it just the filler? Is it the, does it have some functionality? For example, providing cover, providing some pacing. Uh, do I expect to be really thick? Do, uh, do I expect to um house uh, some animal population there can be some gameplay interactions related to it and of course uh, it's always wise to consider your limitations especially in production and technology uh, it's also good to research uh, your environments more properly to try to uh, define uh, some of the items uh, which have already mentioned be the climate biomes altitudinal zones or biotopes and uh, as you probably want a living world the uh, influence of the local populace maybe humans goblins elves or some martians um, uh, might be an interesting thing to play then you consider the variety as you can see on, on the background uh, uh, this scenery created in our new proprietary technology is uh, fairly varied and maybe beautiful. Like we, we commonly associate beauty with the variety of colors and shapes. Uh, but then as a game developers with the very limited capabilities of production, we have to focus the variety either on species. So you create a lot of different species because you, for example, want uh, a gardening simulator with many um, uh, many kinds of products you can sell on a local market or as uh, as is the case with bohemia interactive we are after habits uh, usually it's age-driven variants and of course uh, uh, focusing on habits also allow us to uh, uh, slightly uh, lower the performance costs then you can establish priorities uh, to depict any consistent game world, you should definitely have some mainstays, some ubiquitous uh, uh, species like the Norway spruce, uh, uh, Pizza Abies, or uh, the beach we have mentioned uh, to create a forest like on the image below. Or uh, if you are, for example, doing some mountaineering game from Styria and your uh, <laughs> target group are also botanists, you are definitely going for Calianthem anemonoides, which is endemitic plant. Uh, endemitic means it lives nowhere else in the world, just in one particular place. But you can use uh, this setting information uh, also for some geospecific species. So, uh, you know, sakuras, uh, saguaro, uh, uh, cacti, or African baobabs. Uh, they sort of predetermine that uh, you're somewhere on the globe. They are so well known that you can use these telltale uh, 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 vegetation or telltale plants to really signal to players that they are on some specific place on the earth. And of course, you can also consider the gameplay functionality. So there may be some species required for you uh, for the game loops, for example, providing food, uh, indicating uh, presence of water like we do with billows and reeds in daisy or uh, you can have uh, obstacles made of cacti to cause pain to game avatars when you start researching the 
vegetation or plants, uh, it's not necessary to delve into too much detail. Uh, I would definitely recommend to travel light. Observe the wall rather than the details because you can get marred really quickly. Uh, biology and uh, uh, all the uh, plant associated science is really huge and definitely you don't need that. Instead, go outside, try to learn about the environment you uh, envision for your game and abstract and simplify. We, we do it and it works perfectly, even for very authentic game worlds. But before you start, some useful tips. Uh, plants are organized in a system uh, uh, based on the similar distinct traits, which are unique to certain group. Uh, Plants are organized into taxons. Uh, you can see on the right that it goes from life down to species, which is the basic unit. Uh, and uh, uh, those species are uh, grouped in, uh, in, in, some, in some hierarchy. And uh, for you, uh, it has a rather limited use, but there is one important thing associated with that, and it's the binomial nomenclature of species developed by uh, Swedish natural philosopher Carl Linné in the end of 18th century. Uh, let's look at Petula Pendula Roth. Don't worry, I'm not trying to bewitch you or anything. It's just a Latin scientific name of uh, common white birch. Betula is genus, used as noun. Pendula is species, used as adjective. Roth is its author of the last uh, acknowledged scientific description of the species. Uh, which brings me to the danger of synonyms. Be aware that the same plant throughout the history of science could have been named very differently. So, for example, Linna named uh, uh, Betula, uh, sorry, Birch Betula alba. So it would be Betula alba L. Uh, only a uh, long time after his death, uh, it turned out that there are more birches in Europe than the one he, uh, he expected. Uh, definitely, if you use scientific names, you get better results. Uh, usually, uh, they will be more reliable. If you are using books, I definitely do like to use uh, the books with photos, like the one I'm having here. It's my little Bible. I uh, hope the camera is working. But uh, if you find a book with drawings, uh, drawings uh, usually communicate uh, typical traits much better. Uh, so especially if you want to go for a stylized look, drawings are fine. Uh, then if you find some references, they may vary. You should be aware of age, stress, phenological phase, slash season, and uh, also uh, Internet can spit something very weird on, on, on yourselves. Uh, you've already seen those pictures of the uh, forest pine. The bluish thing in the middle is the forest pine, Pinus sylvestris, as well. It's, uh, it's just a variety. Some gardener was breeding for some time to achieve this specific look. Uh, so, uh, especially if you hit some uh, garden market. Uh, and, shop, uh, and you want to extract some references, be ready for some crazy stuff. Uh, and of course, uh, if you want to uh, be really thorough, it's just good to go out and uh, compare things with literature or visit the botanical garden. In, in any case, uh, having a broader context is good for researching plants. Uh, let me show you a very few practical examples of how uh, we try to approach uh, plant assets. Uh, naturally, we try to define the needs uh, before everything else. And uh, then we try to select particular categories of species, ranging from trees, shrubs, and plants. You know, due to their various size, they provide, provide various cover. And we also have something we call clutter, which is surface-based simple models of, for example, grass. Uh, as our worlds are fairly big, we go for the most abundant species, uh, which are typical for a certain type of aerial, be it biome or biotope. And if needed, we also take a look at the altitude, because even uh, well, for the scale of our, our worlds, 
uh, it's very it's very nice touch to have uh, differences between valleys and the mountain tops. Uh, but our worlds also contain uh, settlements, villages, towns, and uh, we often depict agricultural land. So we also pay attention to species which uh, uh, are there because of agriculture or gardening, or because of other types of human uh, activities like weeds. So rural strategists on the construction site, and also nettles. You know, if you find nettles somewhere in the forest, you can make sure uh, that uh, there was some settlement. So uh, these normal ubiquitous uh, plants also have a uh, big place in our asset lists. Uh, then we also want to reflect some specific ecolog ecological condition and often it leads to some very distinct look of particular word parts like the pines here, obviously inhabiting some dry, rocky, inhospitable place, uh, only uh, only pines, rowans, and birches are able to colonize. We do field trips, of course, either to just get the context or uh, for obtaining references for art production, be it photogrammetry or gathering textures. Uh, besides camera, uh, we need a lot of time. Uh, uh, we are usually bringing some scale with us. It can it can even be your uh, colleague as it's depicted on the, uh, on the lowest picture. Uh, we usually carry folding reflector boards for the illumination and um, also as a background, we have some background clothes. And what's important, gray uh, plate or a color calibration board is perfect once you want to uh, make uh, uh, the colors of the scene consistent. Uh, when we are selecting habits, uh, we are doing that based on the age classes and the crown types, and possibly we are adding variants which are stressed or dead. And higher the abundance, the more variants. Well, this is fairly dated uh, drawing of mine uh, depicting a, a Siberian pine. Uh, and uh, here from the left, you can see a seedling, some normally developing um, growing tree. Uh, some crooked tree, which uh, is uh, designed for some uh, windswept uh, uh, heathlands. Uh, then you can see uh, uh, we have a complete canopy, uh, which is suitable for trees which are uh, growing in the, in the open because they can utilize on the sunlight. Uh, if uh, the canopy is closed in the middle of the woods, then uh, you also also need the version with uh, like a fairly bare trunk and uh, uh, canopy being mostly uh, just on the top. We also employ a lot of tricks to make uh, uh, best use of a very small amount of variants we are using. Uh, to mitigate the risk of repetition, uh, we try to uh, make all the models look different from various angles, making them sufficiently irregular, but not to overdo it, not to add too distinct details. And in the tools, we randomize tilting, rotation, and the size, which uh, together results in a, such a pretty, varied, and very natural looking scenery, like the one on the background. Uh, we also pay attention to appearance. Uh, I've mentioning the, uh, uh, the color, uh, color references, the color checker, uh, Together with specularity, shadows and translucency, uh, we always try to find a way to achieve a realistic look of vegetation. As you can see, uh, this is a screenshot from Livonia, uh, our Arma 3 terrain uh, on the right. Uh, it's a real thing for, from one of my hikes. On the left, this is what our artists did uh, based on the photo. Uh, and as you can see in the real life scene, uh, we see a lot of species here, and uh, there are, uh, there's a light reflecting on some of the canopies. Uh, and definitely, although the chlorophyll is always the same green, uh, they, there may be waxes, there may be some yellowing um, uh, as a result of stress, and uh, uh, different chemical compounds in the uh, in the leaves. This all results in the ver slight variety, which is very nice to achieve, and we we are uh, del deliberately after it so that the, all the species are recognizable and together they form a similar authentic uh, uh, look as the real scene pictured here. Uh, 
also performance uh, with the hundreds of thousands or millions of instances we need to have some techniques uh, like instancing or LODs in our rendering department uh, uh, some uh, game mechanics are very simplified and uh, our artists tend to use the textures efficiently usually for the wall family for one species all its habits it's sharing textures uh, from the design point of view uh, uh, on the right, you can uh, you can see the heat map of uh, frames per second uh, from our Livonia tests. So uh, whenever it's red, it means there's there's a too much local variety. Our map designers were actively uh, fighting this, and also wherever it's green, it means the forests are probably there. It means that the density of instances is high, which can be also taxing for the performance. Uh, to conclude my talk. Uh, I would like to uh, stress that the nature is a great source of inspiration. Uh, even if you're doing something fictional, just looking at the natural richness and the diverse realm of plants and what it offers may give you a lot of great ideas, be it game mechanics or visual. Uh, of course, if you follow the real life botany and ecology, uh, it may result in fairly authentic game environment, which I believe is relatable to players. Players can understand it. And uh, uh, you definitely don't need to worry too much about science. It's just uh, because you're here to entertain people and to stay creative. Thank you for your attention and uh, have a great Game Dev Taste Grads. And I'm looking forward to your questions in a separate channel. Ivan, thank you so much. Um, this was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, can we have a huge round of virtual applause for this very inspirational um, talk? I mean, I I think you know that I get super excited when, when I hear already words like mountains and nature. Um, but I think you really showed a very, very interesting perspective on how games can be um, designed and how to look at maybe from a different um, perspective. Thank you so much. Um, Ivan um, will join us in the Q&A session on Discord, right? Yes, of perfect, course. Uh... Perfect. Thank you so much. So if you have any um, questions for Ivan, um, there is a dedicated speaker Q&A session called Speaker Q&A um, Ivan Buchta. Um, so if you have any qu um, questions or want to say hi to Ivan, um, please do that. And we will be right back with the Austrian game celebration. So stay tuned. We will be back in a few minutes. <laughs>